nomads across the steppelands of Asia, going from southern Russia and Ukraine all the way across Kazakhstan and into China, borderlands in Mongolia, um, have always been a very small number of people, and yet they've had an outside impact on the region's political history. Of course, the most famous was Genghis Khan and the Mongol Empire, who uh, conquered almost all of Eurasia. And one of the questions that scholars seek to, to answer is, how could such a small number of people with a poorly developed economy, uh, low population density, how could they become the political equals, indeed the masters, in some cases, of surrounding sedentary states? When I began looking into this problem, one of the things that I saw was that the nomads, particularly of Mongolia and other parts of the steppe, had become specialists in horse riding and mounted archery. In other words, they became military specialists. And the usual explanation of that is, well, they used that power to conquer other places. But the striking thing was that for the most part, the nomads, particularly among, along China's border, did not attempt to conquer. They attempted to extort. They would attack, burn places down, steal stuff, and then run away before they could be retaliated against. And that was the great advantage. They may be small in numbers, but it was very hard to find them. Herodotus wrote about this when the great Persian uh, king uh, chased the Scythians all over southern Russia. And then he says, you, you people, you know, you have no honor. You will not stop and fight. And they said, why should we stop and fight? We'll lose. We'll just run till you get tired. And eventually he went home. This was a strategy of nomads that allowed them to, to keep themselves militarily strong but practically invulnerable simply by moving because they could move their people, their economy, everything out of the way. But the more interesting thing was they realized you cannot build a state or a really powerful empire just on raiding. And so what they did was cut political deals, particularly with China. That is, we'll stop raiding if you will send us the stuff. And over periods of time, uh, large amounts of silk, wine, other goods were sent to the steppe by China in order to pay the nomads off. It was a form of extortion, a form of appeasement. But appeasement has a very bad reputation because obviously you're appeasing your enemy till he can destroy you. The nomads wanted to be appeased. They didn't have the capacity to rule China. And during the Tang Dynasty, in the 700s, it was said that, um, in 800s, that the Chinese were sending a half million bolts of silk a year to Mongolia. And if you go to Mongolia today, there's a ruined city by the Turkish Uyghur Empire. And even Arabs from Iraq would travel all the way to Mongolia to buy their silk there. Why? Because if you get it for free, your prices can be lower. So we see the nomads becoming great trade centers. And also, whereas the Chinese saw foreign trade as sort of leaking China's resources for useless uh, trade items, nomads love trade. So they invited merchants. So they become sort of the godfathers of the steppe, helping the merchants from places like Sogdia, which is today's Uzbekistan, uh, handle the merchandising side. So we see a wonderfully complex system of these nomads that on the surface of it are just raising sheep, they're just riding around, they're just shooting their arrows, but they're maintaining a system of amazing complexity. And what happens when they do become too powerful, like Genghis Khan and the Mongol hordes? Well, his people do conquer North China. And he says, I wanna go home. And they say, you can't, you own the place. You broke it, you own it. But we see that in the rest of the Mongol empire, even dealing with Russia, is that when they appoint somebody, it's always indirect. So the Mongols are not keen to rule over the Russians directly. They want to rule over the boyars who will collect the taxes for them. And the essence of nomad administration is let somebody else do the work and send you the, uh, uh, the revenue. Over time, this has created very powerful empires, but ones that to their sedentary neighbors are very strange because they seem to lack all the cultural attributes that you would need to be rulers, and yet they've been so successful at it. If we look at the variety of nomad empires, one of the things that we find is they tend to be most centralized on the Chinese side and most decentralized on the Russian side, the Western uh, side of the steppe. And 
One of the reasons for this is that if you're a nomad facing the united power of China, you need to be able to organize yourself at the same level. That is, you need to organize all of Mongolia if you're going to crash uh, the Great Wall, if you're going to convince the Chinese to do business with you. So we find the most powerful nomad empires along the Chinese side, beginning with the ancient Xiongnu, which around 200 BC united almost exactly the same time as, as China united. Because in general, the nomads have no particular reason to unite in very large units unless there's some benefit for it. And dealing with United China that did not, did not want to trade or do business with the nomads allowed them to uh, uh, see the reasons for this. So we have powerful nomad leaders creating a Xiongnu Empire. And this is an empire that lasts close to 400 years. Interestingly enough, when the Han Dynasty, which ran from about 200 BC to 200 AD, when it collapses, so does the nomad empire. Because if you're dependent upon uh, the revenues from China, if China has no revenues, then your polity is also going to collapse. So what we see is um, nomad empires in China tending to unify approximately at the same time. Because as I say, there's, there's an important first predatory and then symbiotic relation to them. Why so much less violence on the Western side, on the Russian or Ukrainian side? If we look at the ancient Greeks, and Herodotus writes about the Scythians, what we see is a description of people who are just like the people in Mongolia. But we do not see um, concerns in the earlier periods about the Scythians raiding Greece or even Persia. Well, why weren't they? Where were they getting their wealth? And certainly Herodotus says they were quite wealthy. They had no need to raid because they control the trade routes, the north-south rivers going into Russia. So all the, uh, the, the goods that were moving down the rivers, they were very easy for them to control. So what we see is that they gain their revenue not by organizing militarily, but by controlling the trade. This pattern changes when the Huns arrive because the Huns follow a Sheng Nu. They follow a Chinese policy, which is attack everybody and steal as much as possible and then demand revenue. They're getting huge amounts of gold from the Byzantine Empire. But this strikes the West as very strange. They've seen these nomads before, but they've never been violent. And what we see is two different strategies. One, you use violence in order to get what you want and extort a state. The other is that you dominate the trade network and take 10% off the top. That's probably enough too. But what we don't find in Mongolia are these trade networks unless the nomads create them. So even though you've got the same kind of people, the same mounted nomads, culturally they look very, very similar, their political organizations are quite different because they're adapting to different possibilities. There's a huge debate um, among scholars of nomadic societies about what causes these empires to first arrive. We, we see, for example, as I mentioned, the Xiongnu Empire coming into existence around 200 BC. And some scholars, myself included, says this is a response to centralization in China and that the resources needed to centralize the nomadic empire are coming from China. There are other scholars, and this was particularly uh, popular in earlier uh, Russian work, but it's been revived today, looking at the idea that, no, it must be the result of, of indigenous evolution, is there must be a nomadic elite that's ruling over a peasant class that's supporting a military elite, and they're the ones that are doing this. So we have many people in Mongolia looking for these peasant communities that the nomads are extorting. And my answer is, you're probably not, well, you will not find them because they are not there. That's the mystery. But the mystery is easily solved when you realize you had no need for this when you get your resources from elsewhere. But there are other people that say, well, this, this is, that means that nomad empires are a secondary phenomena. And we want to be primary empires. We want to be like sedentary empires. So they take all of their models of social evolution essentially from the rise of sedentary states. And that's how sedentary states 
gain political complexity. But they're unwilling to mention there may be alternative ways to political centralization, imperial constructions that uh, have nothing to do with internal evolution. It creates what I call shadow empires. That is, they arise in response to political developments elsewhere. But this is an empirical question because since we know when these empires arrived, if you believe that they were dependent upon exploiting peasant farmers in Mongolia, then I say, good, see if you can find these, these, these villages. If you can, then I'll have to admit I'm, a wrong, I'm wrong because the evidence will be with you. But so far, uh, what they find is these villages coming after the nomads have unified and not before. But Mongolia is a big place, so I'm sure we'll have uh, uh, a number of decades of, of dispute about how these things began. The importance of nomads in, in Eurasian history come in two points. One is their ability to essentially create the political framework for what we call the Silk Route, that is the overland trade network that united all of Europe together. Somebody had to provide security to allow these caravans to move from one end of Eurasia to another. Whether we realize it or not, primarily that was nomadic policies. The second thing that's really important, and this comes out of the, the Mongol conquest, if we look at a lot of the places, uh, particularly Russia, that the, uh, the nomads conquered, what we find is a lot of the styles of administration, tax, pol tax policies and other things, actually can be traced back to that occupation. Because when the nomads move into sort of feudal Europe, what does feudal Europe have? It has small boyars ruling over small groups of peasants. The Mongols show, how, show them how to rule on an imperial basis. And while people are loath, I believe, to trace uh, their own histories back to a group like the Mongols, we can actually see that the Mongols provided a lot of the lessons if you're going to talk about state formation and imperial expansion on a, on a large scale, that many of the lessons and techniques that were used to do that by later states uh, had their origins in the success of the Mongols in ruling over very large parts of uh, the Eurasian landmass.